Well, good afternoon, or if any of you are on the West Coast, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, this is me, I'm Debbie Weinstein, uh, Coalition on Human Needs, and we are very delighted to welcome you uh, to budget strategy to pass a COVID bill in the Senate, Reconciliation 101. Uh, we're recording this webinar and we'll get the recording, the slides and other resources to you soon. Uh, and please be welcome to share them with others. Um, we do wanna thank our generous funders that make all of this possible. Um, and so to set this up, President Joe Biden, um, turn that around, uh, get used to saying that, uh, announced his American Rescue Plan last week and it contains many urgently needed items. Um, like all of these uh, listed on the worst slide ever, uh, teeny tiny print, just to illustrate, there is a lot in this legislation and a lot that's very important. This, however, is not the webinar in which we're going to discuss and go through all of this. Um, and you'll get this slide too. But uh, we're going to talk about the process. President Biden wants to zip it through Congress on a bipartisan basis. Uh, he'll need at least 60 votes in the Senate to do that. Well, maybe. It may be a new ball game, uh, but it still helps to know the rules. And we are very fortunate today because we've got some very knowledgeable people from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities to help us understand the options to get these urgent priorities through the Senate. Uh, Joel Friedman is Vice President for Federal Fis Fiscal Policy at the Center. He's an expert in US federal budget and tax issues. He works on international uh, budget issues too. And Tamara Fusil, senior advisor uh, for government affairs at the Center on Budget. Many of you hear her regularly on our COVID-19 Save for All Wednesday calls. You know how knowledgeable she is on what's happening in Capitol Hill and on a host of human needs issues. They're a team. So we're going to hear from both of them and then have time for questions. Please, please, please type your questions in the Q&A box. Um, in the end, uh, after we'll have, I think, a decent amount of time for questions. And then in the end, we'll have a brief uh, anonymous survey on screen. So please help us by uh, filling it out. So I will stop sharing. Uh, my screen and um, and Joel, I think you're going to start, and we're going to get your slides up. Great, thanks, Debbie. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having us, uh, so we can talk about uh, reconciliation. <laughs> um, and uh, basically, I think we're, we're going to try to accomplish two things uh, t in this in this chat. One is. Uh, just to talk about the kind of the basics of reconciliation. I'll go over some of those, the sort of timing and mechanics of how reconciliation works. And then we'll spend a little bit of time uh, talking about how we think it might be implemented uh, over, this, over this next year. Um, so, uh, so we'll go to the first slide. So um, in its simplest, uh, uh, form to think about reconciliation. It's really, it's a process designed to implement the spending and budget policies that are, that are in a budget resolution. Um, it's also, uh, uh, you know, can be used to increase the debt limit. Uh, but the, the, uh, a key point is that it starts with the budget resolution. And the reason that it's used and the reason that people, um, uh, uh, members like it is because there's procedural advantages, particularly in the Senate. Uh, unlike regular legislation, it can't be filibustered. And so it, it only requires a majority vote to pass. So uh, 51 is easier than 60. Um, the trade-off though is, is uh, uh, despite this uh, procedural advantage, is that it follows a different set of rules um, that tend to be uh, a little complicated and uh, sometimes opaque. Um, and, uh, and, and that becomes a challenge. Um, 
one you'll hear a lot about and we'll talk about uh, some today is the Bird Rule named after uh, former uh, Senator Robert Byrd from West Virginia who established these rules um, uh, that are, are now in statute that, uh, that guide this process. Uh, despite these, these sort of hurdles around these rules, it has been used, uh, reconciliation has been used frequently in the past to, uh, for major legislation. Uh, it, it was uh, the, predominantly it's been used to reduce the deficit, but that has not always been the case. Uh, uh, as uh, uh, and uh, in particular, the both the Bush and the and Trump tax cuts have been used in, in, uh, to increase the deficit through reconciliation. So go to the next slide, please. So I'm going to start with um, what you can't do in reconciliation. Um, and again, the, some of these are sort of the bird rules, which we'll talk about more later. Um, but some basic things, you can't uh, make any changes in social security and reconciliation, and you can't make changes that don't score. Uh, so th there's a, uh, it's, it's all about budgetary changes and spending, spending and revenues. Um, and that, and one of the things that doesn't score and that can't be included are budget process changes. Uh, so any kind of changes to budget process rules really can't be part of uh, uh, reconciliation. And then another, another rule to keep an eye on is uh, wh while reconciliation can be used within the period covered by the budget resolution to either increase or, or decrease the deficit, um, over the long term, meaning outside that, uh, uh, that window, you, uh, uh, the rules say you can't uh, uh, increase the deficit. Um, and so these long, this long-term rule is something to keep an eye on um, uh, when, when putting together a reconciliation bill. Next slide, please. So let's just talk about sort of, this is like a generic process. Tamara will talk in a second about how it's gonna unfold uh, this year, uh, we think. Um, but it, again, it begins, a uh, reconciliation process begins with a budget resolution uh, conference agreement. The House and the Senate have to agree on a budget resolution. Uh, reconciliation is optional, doesn't have to be part of the uh, of, a, of a budget resolution, um, but uh, it, it needs to be part of the budget resolution if, if it's going to, if it's, uh, if it's going to happen. And the resolution basically will include uh, what are known as reconciliation directives and uh, that are given to uh, the committees are being directed to, to, uh, 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 to, to do something. And these directives uh, really have two components. One is a dollar target uh, and the other one is a reporting date. Um, so the, the dollar amount is the only thing that's binding on the, on the, um, on the committees so even though the, the resolution may have some policy assumptions about what's behind that dollar, none of that is, is binding uh, on the committee. It's, uh, it, it may be understood and, and implied and the committees uh, uh, hopefully will be, uh, you know, will be following along the, with the contours of the resolution, but the details of exactly what goes in uh, uh, a, a, a committee's uh, action to, uh, to meet the target is uh, it, all those details are, are up to them. Um, and again, the, the target can either be to increase or, or decrease the uh, uh, spending or revenues or, or, or the deficit. Um, the rules are, are uh, admittedly a little bit uh, uh, biased uh, towards reducing the deficit. Uh, as I mentioned, outside the budget window, uh, you, you, can't, uh, you, you can't increase the deficit. Uh, so, uh, um, but uh, you, you can you can go either direction inside the window. Um, a key a key constraint on on committees is that they can only use things in their committee uh, in the jurisdiction of their committee to hit their target. Uh, so the agriculture committee can't uh, propose raising revenues uh, 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 that are in the jurisdiction of the finance committee in order to uh, 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 to, to hit their hit their target. Um, and then again, they're, they're given a, a reporting date. Uh, it's helpful for signaling the sort of process that everyone uh, uh, hopes to meet going forward, but it really doesn't, it's not a binding, doesn't have a, a, a consequence. Uh, uh, if, if multiple committees are given instructions, reconciliation instructions, then they go to the budget committee and the budget committee uh, compiles them. Uh, and, then, uh, and then from the budget committee, they would go to the floor. And at this point, uh, the, uh, this is where the House and the Senate really get, get quite different. Uh, the House 
basically looks the same when it goes to the floor. Uh, like any piece of legislation, it would go through the rules committee and that would set the, the terms of the debate. But in the Senate, uh, you, you now have this unusual uh, uh, process. It's time limited. There's 20 hours of debate in the, in the Senate. Um, but, uh, and so there's no, there's no filibuster, um, but uh, th uh, there is no limit on the number of amendments. There's restrictions on uh, the type of things that can be come up as amendments, uh, but because there's no limit on amendments, uh, but there is a limit on times of debate, you can have uh, what's called this votorama at the end, which is that, that, that you could be out of time, and then you have a bunch of amendments that are stacked up uh, that still need to be voted on. Um, I, I'd say it's a little, it's a little more famous uh, around the budget resolution where the votorama can go well into the night uh, and into the next morning. Uh, and uh, it's a little more muted, I would say, uh, uh, traditionally in the in reconciliation, uh, but it is a um, uh, it, it is part of the process. And then once the House and Senate have agreed to uh, 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 to each of their bills, and in theory they would go to a conference to resolve those differences, and then and then pass a conference agreement and send that off to the president. Um, you'll see uh, there's an asterisk uh, next to a couple of these uh, saying that, the, that this step is not always done. Uh, uh, so, for instance, uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, it's happened where the Senate simply takes up the House pass uh, a reconciliation bill and skips the committee process uh, in the Senate. Um, uh, or similarly, the Senate will just uh, send over their version of, of, of the bill to the House for the House to deal with rather than going to a, a committee. So some of these processes can be, uh, uh, some of these steps can be, uh, uh, um, can be skipped and have been in, in the past. So now let me turn it over to, uh, to Tamara, who is going to talk a little bit about how it's going to happen or uh, how it might happen this year. Thanks, Joel. And um, if you could advance the slide. Great. So I think the um, important thing to say at the outset is that there have been absolutely no decisions by congressional leaders to use the budget reconciliation process yet. At this point, it's still a tool to the, available to them, and they are trying to figure out what makes the most sense. We know over the weekend um, that there's going to be a, a group of 16 senators, bipartisan group meeting with uh, you know Brian Deese and uh, others at the White House to talk through uh, the opportunity to pass the American Rescue Plan if they find that they're able to come to an agreement that would enable them to pass um, uh, such a package with 60 votes, then they likely wouldn't use reconciliation. But um, if not, then reconciliation would be available to them if they didn't think that they'd be able to meet the 60 vote threshold in the Senate. So just sort of saying that at the outset. Um, what's important to note about this year is that they have a couple of bites of, uh, at the apple to use um, reconciliation instructions. Um, as we know, they didn't pass, a Congress didn't pass a budget resolution last year. So the fiscal year 2021 budget resolution is available as well as a budget resolution available for this year, the fiscal year 22 um, budget resolution. Each one of those can, um, can be taken up by Congress uh, and passed with reconciliation instructions that would provide um, two different opportunities uh, to, to use the reconciliation process. So um, what we have heard is that if they don't get the 60 votes that they need, or it doesn't look like they, they're going to be able to get the 60 votes they need for the American Rescue Plan, then they will go ahead and use reconciliation for this process. Uh, they can, um, you know, it can, it can be, be because, of, you know, we're not trying to go after Social Security or, or do other things um, that, uh, aren't allowable under reconciliation. It, it, we think that um, uh, much, if not um, almost all of uh, what was in the American Rescue Plan could be drafted in such a way that it could be um, passed through reconciliation. Um, so they would, they would start that process using the fiscal year uh, 2021 budget resolution. We know that they are targeting to get um, to move this quickly. Um, with uh, hopefully getting it done by mid-March when the enhanced UI benefits are set to expire. Um, so they, um, this process does take, can take longer than uh, going through 
a, a regular uh, authorizing appropriation uh, authorizing legislation process because you have to do the two step of the budget resolution and then the reconciliation but they still have enough time to to use this process and uh and complete the process by mid-march um, but then um, they could use this, uh, the second uh, budget resolution, the fiscal year 2022, to take up and pass the uh, recovery plan that we expect that Biden is uh, supposed to announce um, when he gives his joint uh, um, his um, speech before the joint session of Congress uh, sometime in February. We still don't know exactly what's going to be in that um, uh, in that package, we think it's going to roughly follow uh, the Build Back Better plan. Uh, it will include infrastructure and climate and uh, some other pieces, but they could they could take uh, the outlines of, of that package and use um, the fiscal year 22 budget resolution to pass that through reconciliation. Um, so that, that's one um, possible uh, path that I think a lot of people think is, is possible. But again, this is um, develop, um, you know, it will continue to evolve as conversations continue. So passing it back to you, Joel. Thanks, um, you can go to the next slide. So now we're gonna do, uh, we'll do a little deeper dive into the bird rule. Um, and uh, uh, it, it, it lays out these uh, things that it, it refers to as extraneous provisions, so things that aren't allowed. Um, we've a, a number of them we, we've already uh, talked about. For instance, uh, that that, it, that uh, you can't change Social Security in in a reconciliation bill. Uh, that changes have to be within a committee's jurisdiction, um, or that you can't create costs um, in any year outside the outside the budget window. Um, that, for instance, that that rule. That's the reason that the uh, Bush and Trump uh, tax cuts uh, sunset uh, after uh, at, at the end of the ten-year period, so they didn't have costs in the uh, in, in in the out years, um, and then and then the other um, uh, uh, the other part of the bird rule uh, again is that it has to be budgetary that uh, it, it has to change spending or revenues. Um, this is where it gets a little tricky in the bar, in, in the in the uh, uh, with the bird rule because. Um, it also says that for some things that have a budget effect, it could be deemed as, uh, those budget effects could be deemed as merely incidental, uh, meaning that the, it's, uh, the, the Senate parliamentarian concludes uh, that it's not really uh, the main purpose of a provision, uh, the, the budgetary impact. Uh, an example from the, uh, recent, uh, the recent rounds of, of reconciliation um, uh, was around the, the, um, the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, uh, uh, um, um, the individual mandate uh, for uh, people to have health insurance. Uh, when the Republicans tried to repeal that, uh, even though there was a, a significant budgetary effect uh, to that, the Democrats argued that that was uh, uh, merely incidental to the larger policy uh, uh, change because of the role of the mandate in the overall ACA. And the parliamentarian agreed with that, so that it, that was ruled uh, merely incidental. Um, and so they they didn't repeal the uh, the, the mandate. They were uh, um, instead just just uh, uh, zeroed out the penalty. On the other side, uh, the Democrats also argued that uh, the proposal in the reconciliation bill to um, to drill in the uh, Arctic National Wild uh, Refuge um, that raised a couple billion dollars. Uh, that those revenues associated with that were, were uh, would be uh, merely incidental to the environmental impacts of of drilling in Anwar, and the parliamentarian disagreed with that. Um, so you can see that there it's uh, 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 it's a really a case by case um, issue um, for deciding this merely incidental. Um, the flip side of uh, is is that uh, you can actually have provisions that have no budget effect. Uh, whatsoever, uh, but if they are deemed a term and condition of of a, of a budgetary policy, uh, then it could uh, uh, then it can be allowed. Um, here, an example, for instance, is a is a block grant, uh, some type of a grant to the states, and the instructions on how the states uh, can use those uh, uh, grant funds. It, it won't change any of the totals of the grants. Uh, um, so it's not the, 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 it's not budgetary, but it's a it's what's viewed as a term and condition for uh, for the grant itself, and that and and so therefore it, it would be allowed. 
Um, so uh, uh, there's uh, uh, well, a lot of the rules are, I think are are uh, are pretty clear cut. Others are are much murkier and require and really require. Um, uh, decisions made by the parliamentarian, and those tend to be uh, argued out uh, uh, with the parliamentarian. And a lot of provisions are dropped out even before uh, the, the the process makes it out into uh, uh, the bill makes it out into public. Uh, but if they are, uh, if if a if a, a provision violates the bird rule, um, uh, it, it the only way to waive that uh, is uh, with 60 votes. And, um, and then if you don't get the waiver, then the provision is struck. So that's why there's so much sensitivity around these, uh, 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 around these bird rule provisions because it, uh, it brings back uh, the 60 vote uh, requirement. So now uh, we'll go on to the next slide, which we'll talk about some of the issues that we're likely to see um, cropping up. I, if, if you've been following this in the press, some of these things have already come up in the, in, in the press. One of the issues, uh, uh, the the um, the relief package that the new administration has sent up included a number of um, uh, funding for what would traditionally be discretionary programs, and uh, uh, and traditionally uh, discretionary uh, uh, programs, uh, 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 things that go through normally go through the appropriations committee have not been part of uh, of, of reconciliation. Um, but in reality, it's more of a um, it's more of a convention. Uh, there's uh, there's really nothing in the rules that uh, that that we think uh, precluded either the bird rule or or, or other rules. Um, and it's and in part because the relief package, uh, you know, is really just short term kind of one off funds to uh, to these uh, uh, to these programs. That makes it a, a, probably a little easier than if you were to try to move regular appropriations bills, which also have all sorts of other um, language in them, and then you can run into problems around the the terms and conditions and merely incidental and 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 those issues. Um, so, uh, we our, our sense is is that uh, discretionary programs could be included as part of this process. That the actual form. I, I think is still probably open to debate how they'll do it because there isn't isn't a history of doing this. Um, but in any event, it will require some coordination with the with the appropriations committee. Another another issue that will come up, uh, particularly on the relief uh, uh, package, the, the the CARES Act and the one that passed in December, all of those were designated as emergencies. But that type of uh, 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 emergency designation would be considered a budget process uh, uh, language, and that's precluded under the bird rule. So you can't include uh, an emergency designation in a, um, uh, in, in a, in a reconciliation bill. Um, and that creates a, an issue because that means the cost of the, of the reconciliation bill would end up on the statutory uh, pay-as-you-go scorecard, which could trigger a sequestration at the, in January 2022 of, of, of sequesterable uh, mandatory programs. Um, and so then the issue is, is how do you get, you got to get the costs off the scorecard to, uh, at some point during the year to, um, uh, to avoid that sequestration. So they'll, they'll have to be some type of subsequent legislation in order to deal with that. Um, that has been the, that's uh, uh, what Republicans did uh, with regard to their tax cuts, which obviously cost, uh, cost money. Uh, and, and would have triggered sequestration of, of uh, Medicare and farm price supports and, and other things that are, are, are sequesterable, but they passed, uh, they included a, the, the waiver um, in, in sort of must pass legislation. I think one was a CR, another one was a defense related matter. And, um, and, uh, and, and so it was enacted. So I think the, the question for, for uh, uh, um, going forward is whether or not, because if Republicans uh, aren't supporting this bill, will there be an issue with, with, uh, with dealing with that, uh, uh, things on the statutory page you go scorecard. Another, another issue that's popped up is um, around mandates, um, things like the, um, uh, the minimum wage and whether or not that were part of the, the, the Biden package um, and whether or not those will be allowed uh, in reconciliation. Um, again, uh, 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 when it came to the Affordable Care mandate, the parliamentarian ruled 
that uh, that that uh, she thought those types of things were were merely incidental uh, to the budgetary changes. So even if the minimum wage showed some um, uh, uh, some budgetary effects, uh, then uh, uh, the question is how the parliamentarian will will rule. And again, these things will get will get hashed out. Um, and uh, so it's an important question going forward uh, um, on on that one. And then finally, it's it's worth uh, just reiterating. I think what what uh, uh, Tamara alluded to, which is uh, th this is sometimes called a fast track or an expedited process, and it is in some respects in the Senate because of that uh, the the debate is limited, um, but it does have a lot of steps in it uh, with the, both the budget resolution and then the reconciliation process, and then all the uh, uh, um, behind the scenes haggling over the over the bird rule. Sometimes that process could be referred to as a bird bath, where they, you know, they're scrubbing the bill for for uh, um, uh, for these bird program uh, uh, bird issues, and so it can it can take some uh, uh, it can take a bit of time. And uh, if if the mid March is the is the uh, is the deadline that that they're shooting for that we're shooting for here to get this the bill passed before the UI um, be uh, benefits run out, then. Um, uh, it's going to require quite a bit of coordination uh, and uh, decisions up front at the beginning of the process in order to get uh, everything lined up, and and uh, so we we can go through these these uh, these various steps. So that's um, that's that's what I've got for for, for this. Happy for any 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 questions. Okay. Um, Which will, and all the questions will refer to the Senate parliamentarian because that's ultimately the person who. Right. Who, uh, um, well, there are uh, a number of questions here. Um, I'll start reading some of them. Um, and I will all, uh, also encourage people to continue to write them into the Q&A box. It is a little easier on me if you keep them to the Q&A box and not sprinkle them throughout the chat and the Q&A box. But, um, uh, so first, thank you both for the presentation. Uh, there, um, there were a number of questions that came up more than once. Um, so, and in part, you were um, answering this, but I think it it it's not so bad with complex matters to go over some of it again. And so, uh, one question was, um, how did it work out? when big tax cuts were passed, either in the Bush years or the Trump years, that um, clearly have an impact on the deficit. And you're saying that they're not supposed to have a long-term impact on the deficit. How could those be done through reconciliation? And I know you um, did explain, but um, give it to us again. Sure. So I think there's, I mean, there's two points to, to keep in mind. Um, with a, when a reconciliation bill increases the deficit, the, the first issue is around this issue around the costs going on the, on the, on the pay-as-you-go scorecard, the statutory pay-as-you-go scorecard that could lead to sequestration. And so um, you, you can't exempt it uh, in the reconciliation bill. So that needs to be addressed in a subsequent piece of legislation. And uh, the Republicans did that. Um, uh, through um, again through they use sort of must pass vehicles like a, 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 a continuing resolution or, 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 or something um, and and they addressed it there the way they dealt with the long-term issue because uh, they wanted these tax cuts to be permanent uh, was is that they they were forced to sunset them um, uh, uh, within the window um, uh, some may remember back uh, I, I think it was 2012, we had the fiscal, there was a fiscal cliff um, in, in which uh, all the tax cuts from the Bush years were going to expire. And then uh, a, an agreement was made uh, with President Obama where some were extended and, and particularly those at the top were, um, uh, were not and were allowed to expire. In the, for the Trump tax cuts, uh, they expire uh, on, the, on the individual side in 2025. Um, and so there'll be a, a, a bit of a cliff there for, for those as well that, that, that will face then. But that's how that's how those were addressed. Um, I would say that, I mean, for, for going forward, I mean, the way Tamara uh, uh, sketched it out, probably for the first bill, um, 
uh, these issues are run the costs outside the window. If it's a relief bill targeted towards, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, Im immediate relief, most of that is is a temporary and and more short term in terms of their costs, and is un unlikely to to be on, uh, um, uh, you know, have have uh, costs outside the outside the window. But the second bill, I think, is where this issue will come up. Um, uh, you know, more substantially, if if it is like a, an infrastructure bill or climate change bill, and and as part of that, there are some uh, uh, changes in, to, to law that they would like to have permanent, and they would have permanent costs. Then you're looking at offsets for those, or or sunsetting them. Um, there are a bunch of uh, uh, questions that are being added here. I am going to ask um, one, uh, just for people who aren't so steeped in all of this. When you talk about uh, statutory paygo, I'm not sure, and sequestration, I'm not sure everybody quite gets what that is. Uh, so maybe a, a little 101 on that, if you don't mind. Sure. So uh, uh, paygo, yeah, I apologize for the for the the shorthand. Paygo uh, is uh, um, uh, uh, it's short for pay as you go. And it's a, a rule that says that if you uh, if you if you have a cost uh, through an in increased uh, uh, spending on a on a on a mandatory program, so this doesn't deal with discretionary uh, uh, programs, not and, and nothing that goes through the appropriations committee. Um, so um, if you if if you have a a, a cost of either in a, in a a mandatory program or um, uh, a tax cut that that cost, it has to be offset um, one way or, or, or another. You can offset spending with, with, uh, by raising revenues or you can pay for revenues by, by, uh, um, uh, by cutting spending. Um, and that if there isn't, if it isn't offset, uh, then it goes onto a scorecard that OMB keeps. And at the end of each uh, season uh, or each uh, congressional set, uh, session, um, it uh, tallies up what's on the scorecard, and if there is a net uh, cost, uh, then it would then it, it could trigger a sequestration, uh, which is a, an across-the-board cut in in a, uh, a set of programs that are um, uh, uh, vulnerable to to, uh, uh, to to being uh, to this across-the-board uh, cuts. Um, these are things like uh, uh, Medicare, although that's limited. I think it's a four percent reduction is uh, is uh, the, the largest the cut can go there, and there's uh, farm price supports and, uh, and and a range of other programs. A number of programs, so importantly, uh, particularly programs that that we all care about, are exempt from sequestration. So safety net programs, um, uh, Medicaid, SNAP, things like that, are not uh, subject to, to sequestration. Um, so, so the so the pay as you go process basically is uh, um, uh, tries to get uh, a Congress when it passes legislation to pay for it, and then it enforces it uh, at the end of the session by uh, looking back at what Congress has done. And if it hasn't uh, paid for things, then it uh, um, uh, it would re require a, a cut in these pro programs to make up uh, uh, for, for that cost. There's also just a just to complicate things, because that's the way uh, these budget process rules always are. Both the House and Senate have their own sort of uh, uh, pay-as-you-go rules that sometimes you'll hear about, um, and those uh, uh, can be waived and 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 are less, I would say, are less consequential in this context than uh, than the statutory one. But so this, the statutory one, can also be waived, and and there is a question as to whether that would require 60 votes in the Senate to waive? Yes, it would, it would. You can't, it's not allowed under the, uh, it's not allowed to be part of the reconciliation bill. So it couldn't go in uh, uh, with the, just a majority 51 votes in, in reconciliation. Um, uh, and so it, it would have to uh, either go along in a, uh, in a separate piece of legislation or you'd have to try and waive the bird rule and both of those would require, uh, typically require 60 votes. So, the rule certainly um, requires 60 votes. The other legislation, uh, if it's a, like, uh, the assumption is, is it'll need 60 votes for filibuster reasons. 
So that's where the bird bath comes in that uh, people do try to scrub from the um, reconciliation uh, bill things that um, uh, could get um, uh, thrown out because of this or things that uh, would require that 60 vote to overcome? That, that's, uh, that's absolutely right. Um, uh, I, I think I, I would say there, there was a time you can have things in a reconciliation bill that violate the bird rule because it, uh, if, uh, but it requires that, that no one raises a point of order, meaning it doesn't happen automatically once it's, once it's on the floor, a member has to raise a point of order. And oh, uh, uh, going back to when reconciliation started in the 80s, there, there were a lot of provisions that violated the bird rule that stayed in reconciliation bills because no one raised a point of order. Um, but I would, I would say in more recent times, the process has become much more um, contentious uh, and, and it's almost competitive in the way that the sides are, are looking for things, for language that can be birdable, uh, that, that, can, yeah, that can be struck. And so there's a whole uh, process uh, uh, by which the, the two sides, uh, the Democrats and the Republicans will make the case around certain languages a certain language in, in, a, in a bill, proposed language in a bill, they'll make the case to the parliamentarian as to why it should be in or shouldn't be allowed. And then the parliamentarian uh, ultimately rules. Um, and, and, then, and then it's up to the majority. Uh, they can decide uh, even if they know the, uh, where the parliamentarian stands, maybe they still wanna uh, leave it in the bill and, and, and require the Republicans to, to raise a point of order, someone to raise a point of order on the floor so it can be part of a public debate or, or, or something. But, but uh, a lot of that is, uh, is adjudicated uh, um, uh, even before it gets onto the, uh, onto the floor. So um, in you mentioning the parliamentarian, one question that's come up is um, who appoints the parliamentarian? And uh, in your observation, um, have they been uh, pretty straight shooters or um, uh, do you think that um, they tend to skew their decisions based on um, uh, who's in power? That's a good, that's a, a good question. I think Tamara may have some views on this too. I mean, it's the, it's the, uh, it's the majority leader that appoints the, um, uh, the parliamentarian. And um, I would say that the parliamentarians are, are, you know, there's a lot of precedent they work, they work from. I, I think that they're, they're um, you know, the, the, the rules are, <laughs> the rules are a little opaque um, and, and they don't always make a, a huge amount of common sense, um, but, uh, but they are what they are. And I, and I think the parliamentarians, you know, are, are sticking by those rules and they're very worried about, about, uh, about precedent and the and the procedures and and uh, you know institutional issues with within the Senate and they they don't really play uh, um, uh, partisan uh, politics um, and uh, um, but I would also say that they they try not to uh, you know they also I think work with both sides to try and uh, um, make the process move move along as well. And I would just add to that, while it, the parliamentarians appointed by the majority leader, it, it's, it's not like we expect a new parliamentarian to right. be put into place because they have a long history of working in a bipartisan way. We expect the current parliamentarian to stay, uh, to stay in place. Well, that, that's illuminating right there. Thanks, Tamara. Um, well, I know you specifically mentioned the minimum wage as a uh, questionable area for uh, whether it could be included in reconciliation bill, but there were a couple of questions about that. Um, so, um, and of course I'm, I'm directing these questions to either of you who choose to answer. So uh, um, maybe just go over again, uh, how the decision-making might work around something like the minimum wage. Sure, so the, the um... I don't know how the decision will be made. I, the, 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 the arguments I think uh, will be that the, that uh, 
uh, I mean, I think the most, the best and most recent example was again, was around the Affordable Care Act um, where the Republicans tried to repeal the individual mandate for health insurance. Uh, and so the minimum wage is, uh, is a, uh, a mandate on business to pay their employees a, 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 certain, uh, a certain minimum dollar uh, wage, a $15 wage. Um, and the parliamentarian uh, rule that uh, for the Affordable Care Act, that even though it had a budgetary consequence, getting rid of getting rid of the, uh, uh, the, the, the the ACA's individual mandate, that that um, <clears throat> those budgetary effects were again quote unquote merely incidental to the to the larger policy impact that was that was uh, at at hand, um, and and so. If one assumes that the that the um, uh, that a similar approach is taken to the minimum wage, then um, then uh, the parliamentarian may not look favorably on that as something that would be allowed in in um, uh, in reconciliation. I think my understanding is that it, when when CBO has quote unquote scored uh, minimum wage, uh, they, they did a report a year or two ago on it. And they, they actually just, the only score they showed just had to do with the, the, uh, um, the implications for federal workers. Um, and, uh, and so the number, the, the, the budgetary impact was, there was some, but it was quite small, but they also acknowledged that it, it, would, have, uh, it would have effects out in the economy and more broadly as well, pluses and minuses that's, uh, that, 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 uh, uh, some people would see higher wages and therefore would end up paying uh, more taxes, uh, higher, uh, you know, uh, higher taxes. So that would be, um, that would raise revenue. Other people would lose, uh, a, a small number of people would lose their jobs uh, uh, with, with a higher minimum wage, according to CBO's estimates. And that would, that would go in the other direction. Um, and then other people who uh, sort of ripple through the, the, um, uh, uh, through the economy in different ways. And CBO hasn't estimated that those sort of full effects. And I think there, there'll probably be some pressure um, uh, uh, on them to, to, to give a fuller estimate. Um, so it's possible that that fuller estimate could show that it, uh, uh, you know, could, could tip the balance in terms of budgetary effects versus policy change. Um, but it's, it's a, you know, we're, we're ultimately uh, getting into the, uh, um, into the mind of the uh, of the parliamentarian, and I think you know both sides will make uh, the, the supporters and the opponents of it will make uh, 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 try and make arguments on on either side. Yeah, if if I could just jump in uh, just to sure. sort of re uh, reiterate what what Joel said there, I know that um, Chairman Sanders has uh, been making the case that you can do minimum wage under reconciliation, um, and you know we're not. We're not we're not trying to argue against that. I, right. it, you know, our reading of how the parliamentarian rule has ruled in the past it seems to, it's, it's our thinking that will be a, a tough case to make. But you know, we're we're fully supportive of them trying to make the case and make the argument. Yeah. So um, well, thanks you both for that. Um, the there's a question uh, that again kind of. Um, uh, goes to the controversy over uh, a ruling by the parliamentarian. Um, and so uh, sort of take us through, would the presiding officer overrule or seek to overrule the parliamentarian about waiving a budget point of order and what happens next? I, um, you know, is the vote about overruling the parliamentarian, uh, does that require a simple majority or is that a 60 vote? So, well, I guess there's two, there's two questions here. Uh, I, I think, I mean, one is the, the, um, the, the, the chain of, <laughs> The chain of activity, as I understand it, is the you know the parliamentarian. Uh, you know, someone will raise a point of order. Uh, they'll direct it to the uh, presiding officer, um, uh, and uh, who's the person sitting in the chair, and uh, and they'll get advice from the parliamentarian, and um, and then and then they'll uh, give the ruling, uh, uh, typically based on 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 that advice. 
people, uh, you can appeal the ruling of the chair, uh, but in this case, uh, it requires 60 votes to overturn that. Um, it, it's different than uh, the, uh, and Tamara, I think knows the intricacies of this a little better than I do, but uh, to, to undo, to um, when they've narrowed the scope of the filibuster, that's also been an issue around uh, appealing the ruling of the chair, but that those only require, um, uh, that only required a majority vote. But for these types of budget points of order, it requires uh, 60, it requires 60 votes. Um, I think the other part of the question was, is, is could the presiding officer ignore the, uh, the parliamentarian and give a different, uh, a different ruling? Um, I, 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 is, is that, that's cer certainly possible. I, you know, I don't know what the, uh, the, I mean, that's basically kind of blowing up the, uh, um, the process and, um, and, uh, and that, uh, but that's, that's, <laughs> it's, you know, I think there's a, uh, all these things are, are, I guess, part of the conversation. I don't know if Tamara's got a, a better explanation for, for how these things uh, yeah, unfold. It's, and, uh, it's, I haven't heard talk that they're going to go that route. Yeah. yeah, I don't think that's our uh, main issue, but certainly the issue of uh, uh, a vote on the floor to overrule uh, a, parl a parliamentarian's ruling, that does happen sometimes. So, um, so uh, okay, so there, there are a lot of questions. Um, uh, if the parliamentarian flags language as a violation of either the bird rule or the social security bar, uh, do the uh, leaders on the bill have a chance to go back and fix the language? Um, uh, do, have you, anybody recall uh, whether that's happened? Sure. I, I mean, again, this is, I mean, because a lot of the scrubbing for uh, bird rule violations happens while the while the bills are being drafted and 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 reviewed, um, and so you could you know they can offer if it if it happens uh, you know while it's being considered in committee it can be it can be fixed there uh, it can be uh, addressed I guess as a, as an amendment on the uh, you know on on the floor so it it it, it is possible um, uh, you know to try and to try and do it. And, and I, I think, you know, truthfully, the, the committee staff is, is uh, uh, in the Senate are pretty savvy about this stuff and we'll try and, and certainly for more obvious things, we'll, we'll try and draft things in a way that, that don't run afoul of it. Um, there, there's a um, good question here about automatic stabilizers in a package. A lot of us uh, feel that what's most important is that uh, there are kind of automatic triggers for um, uh, benefit increases or other things like that kicking in when the economy warrants it, but they're not considered temporary payments, the question says. Uh, so can you envision a way that you could include automatic stabilizers in a reconciliation bill? We didn't say that these would be easy questions. It's interesting. I have never seen. I haven't. I haven't seen a score of how CBO, um, you know, would would treat, um, uh, you know. Like, I'm assuming what we're talking about is that the, a provision would only be turning on or turning off uh, based on uh, economic circumstances, and if that were put uh, permanently into law, then I, I guess the question is: is would CBO score uh, permanent costs? Um, and then that would then uh, potentially run afoul of the of the rule that says you can't have costs outside the outside the window. So then I think the issue would be finding an offset uh, or 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 sunsetting it. Um, I don't know, Tamara. I don't know if you've thought about that one at all. Yeah. I, I... I think that you're right about the offset versus the sunset. I also think there's a question about when you score um, automatic stabilizers in some instances, 
There could be some savings if it's shutting benefits off earlier than they otherwise might be. Um, so I think it gets a little bit complicated, um, but I think that there would be a, a way that you could draft them. They might just not be as satisfactory as you uh, could do if you went outside of reconciliation. Something to ponder. Um, so uh, there are, uh, I just lost one of the questions I wanted to ask. Um, The, so, okay, so is there any advantage to seeking a Democrat Republican 60 vote coalition regarding a new stimulus bill apart from an appearance of unity? Um, yeah, I mean, I think like certainly if you're able to get legislation through a regular process order, then you don't have to worry about all of these bird rules and trying to, um, you know, to, to fit potentially a square peg into a round hole. Writing legislation through regular regular channels is is always the best option, um, but I think in this instance it's largely a political question. If they have to go to a package that has a sixty vote threshold, then uh, likely they would uh, Republicans are going to be unlikely to agree with large pieces of the American Rescue Plan. Um, and the question there is, uh, is that, is it, you know, is it, is it worth um, doing a package that's perhaps half the size or a quarter of the size to get 60 votes um, or to go through a, a process um, that allows for a majority in the Senate, um, but, but a much, a much bigger, um, bigger relief package. Mm -hmm. um, well, this is, a, a little afield. Well, um, I'll save this question for the last one because um, there'll be a transition. But um, so um, the sort of back to sequestration, does OMB have discretion in which programs are cut? I know you mentioned, of course, ones that are exempt. Uh, otherwise, you said across the board and um, so that suggests not discretion, but maybe say a little bit more about that. Right, there isn't there isn't um, a, a discretion. I mean, there's a a, a list somewhere of exempt uh, programs and things that uh, are not exempt. Then would be uh, um, uh, sub, you know potentially subject to sequestration. And there's a you know a formula basically that they follow. Um, Again, because uh, Medicaid, Medicare is the one that I, I, I remember the most that's capped, but you know, there's certain limitations on some programs in terms of uh, how deep the cuts can go. Um, and and um, but yes, it's across the board for anything that isn't uh, isn't exempt. But it's it's pretty well. There there isn't uh, OMB can't decide not to not to um, uh, on on its own to exempt some programs that are not otherwise exempt in statute. Um, okay, so uh, uh, this um, might be next to the last question. Oh, it's a terrible one to be throwing at you. Um, so um, there's the ever popular chimps um, and the question, how do they figure into reconciliation? Um, oh, that's easy, they, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that speeds up that. So, yeah, well, maybe just and to explain. clarify, chimps are changes in mandatory programs. Thank you. That's yeah. uh, good to explain that. But they right, they, no, it's right. They're they're used uh, primarily in the. I mean, they're used in the appropriations process or uh, mandatory uh, uh, programs where uh, savings are are used in order to create more room uh, uh, for 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 discretionary. So, I, uh, it it. Uh, you could the, the, those same savings. I think uh, they tend to be most useful on a one-year basis, uh, whereas a reconciliation is a multi-year uh, process. So, so may not be as useful um, if you wanted to. If you were looking for some type of an offset, um, some of them, how, however, uh, you know, potentially could be used as a way to to generate uh, uh, some savings if you were looking for an offset. But I, I would I would think that the appropriators would 
would not want to use them for that, allow them to be used for that purpose. Um, there is one other question before I get to the last one that um, we'll probably have time for. Um, you said at the outset that there can be um, uh, a budget resolution for fiscal 21 uh, that would have its own set of instructions and then to go later to the budget resolution for fiscal 22 and in that one perhaps the uh, uh, the Biden's Recovery Act provisions. Um, so a, a whole other set. Now, uh, some of us were trying to uh, remember um, if, if things are still in the works on fiscal 21, um, can you sort of launch, in other words, the, the reconciliation bills have not yet passed for 21. Um, but maybe there's starting to be this impetus to get a budget resolution out for 22, um, perhaps even including, uh, uh, you know, appropriations levels, or if they choose to do that. Um, uh, does the uh, startup of fiscal 22 um, budget resolution and reconciliation uh, sort of wipe out uh, what's not finished yet for fiscal 21? Do those reconciliation bills continue to go forward or do you have to finish one and then start the other? That's an interesting question. Maybe Chama remembers better than I do. I mean, the understanding is, is that once the Senate or once Congress moves on, you know, like a, a later year budget resolution that you can't go backwards and work on a previous budget resolution. That, that, that's, that's my understanding. So that would suggest- So you would have if, to complete your action on fiscal year 21 before you turn to fiscal year 22. So Biden might give his speech in February and, uh, but the follow-up might take a, uh, a little while so that they could be done with their uh, reconciliation stuff, which they need to be done before the March 14th deadline of unemployment insurance expiring and all that kind of thing anyway. Right. But, right. I mean, and I think too, when, you know, I, I haven't, I don't believe that they've set a date for Biden's joint address, but he, they had indicated it would be about a month after he took office that puts him and Congress is in recess the week of February 15th. So that puts you to the week of February 22nd. So you're already at the end of February, probably before he makes such a, um, uh, an address. Um, and if we're talking about having this first package concluded by the um, March 14th deadline, it, like it would be really hard for me to see in practical terms, them starting fiscal year 22 budget when they're like a week or two away from finishing fiscal year 21 budget. So I don't think that you'd be in a situation where like you'd have to wait for weeks or something for them to finish the 21 process before they could start on 22. Okay. Well, I want to thank you both very, very much. Um, uh, there, we didn't get to every question because there were quite a lot, but um, we um, did get to quite a few. Uh, we, uh, again, will be sending things out um, uh, afterwards, uh, including the slides. People did ask that. Um, and um, there was one question that, uh, what can state advocates do? And uh, Nikolai, if you wouldn't mind sharing that um, last slide that I had up. Okay, here's my plug. Uh, here is one thing that anybody can do. Uh, we have a, an action that we're doing jointly with a number of other organizations uh, that calls upon people, individuals, to contact their members of Congress and the easy email way. So this is just a screenshot or kind of one where step one, go to chn.org, step two, uh, click on take action. Step three, you'll see this letter that people can send to members of Congress uh, and it will automatically go to the two senators and one rep for everybody. 
Uh, so step four is where uh, individuals click to uh, send that uh, email along. Um, as of earlier today, um, I guess we had about 45,000 letters because each person doing it uh, is sending three. Um, we really do expect to have many more uh, uh, because some groups with big lists are involved. But this is a plea that you uh, add uh, your organization's networks to this because I think this is really um, an easy to do example to just start to demonstrate to Congress that there's a lot of support for this. Um, whether it's the 60 vote version or the reconciliation version, um, Congress needs to know that people care. Uh, so um, we will include in the email that goes out uh, easy language and the link so you can forward this. If you have it in your heart to do that, um, that's just an easy thing to add to the numbers of people. I'm, I feel pretty confident we can get 100,000 letters out uh, or more, but we could use your help. So um, uh, that's my plug, and it is something that people around the country can do. Um, and uh, Nikolai, if you have uh, that survey um, to put up, uh, I don't that know survey I will go out as soon as we've closed out of the webinar. So, folks, you'll see a brief survey as soon as we um, end here. Um, with just a few questions, the survey is totally anonymous. Uh, we have just started using Zoom as our webinar platform. So if you have any feedback at all, uh, we'd appreciate hearing it from you. Okay, well, that's the way to do it. Um, so thank you all. I'm sorry to, we didn't get to each and every question. Um, uh, join our Wednesday calls for COVID-19 Policy Group and Save for All. Uh, if you are not um, already on those lists, uh, the email that we send out will give you the opportunity to ask to be put on them, and that will enable us to keep sharing information. Uh, thanks to Joel and Tamara. Thanks to all of you for being part of this. Uh, onward and upward, folks. Thank you. <laughs>